The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Roma Labs welcomes you to our webinar. My name is Eva Wanzenberg. I'm the CEO of Roma Labs in Europe. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mr. Franz Bertiller. Franz Bertiller is assistant professor of the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences Vienna and head of the Christian Doppler Labo Laboratory for Mycotoxin Metabolism. He studied chemistry at the University of Vienna. In 2006, he received the Brigitte Gedeck Award from the German Society of Myc Mycotoxin Research for his PhD thesis on masked mycotoxins. Mr. Bert Thieler is an expert in the areas of mycotoxins and mass spectrometry. His scientific output includes 120 publications. Many thanks, Franz, for your time, and now I hand over the presentation to you. Thank you very much, Eva, for this uh, kind introduction and also for the invitation to host the seminar today. So today I want to tell a little bit about masked mycotoxins uh, and uh, very briefly So just checking the system here. Right, now it works. Thanks a lot. So the, the outline of my talk is that I uh, very briefly uh, want to introduce what are mask mycotoxins. They are biotransformation products of mycotoxins in counter. Um, how can we determine uh, and detect uh, masked mycotoxins? Uh, and I want to present one uh, example of a very sophisticated method to do so. Uh, what is the occurrence uh, of a certain masked mycotoxin uh, of deoxynivalinol 3 glucosid which is uh, the mycotoxin, the masked mycotoxin where we currently know the most of? Uh, and finally, and this will be the uh, largest part of this presentation, what about the toxic effects uh, of masked mycotoxins and what is their significance? And finally, uh, I will conclude uh, with a summary. So, uh, as you uh, probably all know, um, mycotoxins are secondary metabolite of molds which are of low molecular weight uh, and which are toxic to uh, mammals, uh, to humans and to animals as like. Uh, they are produced by a variety of filamentous um, fungi like uh, Fusaria, Aspergilli, uh, Penicillium and others. Uh, the occurrence uh, of mycotoxins causes the loss of several hundred million of tons of food and feed uh, worldwide each year. Uh, and the economic losses directly arising from mycotoxins are in the range of one billion uh, US dollar each year. To cope with that, uh, above 100 countries uh, have uh, strict regulations for the control of mycotoxins in food and feed. Still, uh, in uh, my belief, uh, we have um, a gap, um, we have a lack of knowledge uh, where we still don't know uh, enough about uh, mycotoxins. This includes what about the long-term effect of supercooked doses of mycotoxins to which we are exposed each day. What about the synergistic effects of co-occurring mycotoxins? And finally, uh, how are uh, mycotoxins metabolized by a variety of species? So, to come to masked mycotoxins, uh, we have to keep in mind that um, mycotoxins, some of the mycotoxins are produced on the field uh, and first of all, they do not infect uh, ourselves, humans or animals, but they rather infect uh, another uh, living being, which is the plant. Uh, and this scheme should just show you a very crude uh, scheme of a plant cell. Um, so mycotoxins which are formed uh, on the field by the fungi, first of all, in order to, to be effective, have to enter uh, the plant cell. Uh, in the cytosol, the plant tries to defend itself uh, against the fungal invasion uh, and its toxic substances. And one uh, of the strategies the plant has uh, is to convert uh, these toxins to less uh, toxic uh, molecules. For instance, due to the work of glucosyl transferases, converting the toxic substances 
uh, shown here uh, the oxynevalinol uh, and zeralinol uh, to its correspondent uh, or um, um, glucosids. Uh, these forms then are either stored uh, in the big waste bin of the plant cell, the vacuole, where they remain in soluble form or can be further metabolized and incorporated uh, into the cell wall. And uh, one term uh, that um, has, coined, uh, has been coined in the literature in 1990 is the term masked mycotoxins, speaking of substances uh, which are somehow uh, converted by plants uh, and are usually not detected in routine analysis. This slide should just give you uh, a brief example of uh, how capable plants are to convert mycotoxins into other uh, chemical entities. And this is an experiment that uh, we performed uh, some almost eight years ago now. Uh, we have treated one particular plant, in this case Arabidopsis thaliana, with one particular mycotoxin, in this case uh, the estrogenic Fusarium mycotoxin serolinone. So we have um, treated the, uh, the plant with the mycotoxin uh, by immersion uh, of the plant uh, in, a, in, a, in a culture, in a liquid culture, adding the toxin. After 24 hours, uh, we harvested the plants, we extracted the plants, and used liquid chromatography mass spectrometry uh, to analyze for its metabolites. And we found 17 different metabolites. Even more striking, 98% of the serolinone was metabolized um, in, uh, to these metabolites. So the next question um, really is, um, how can we determine, how can we detect masked mycotoxins? And I briefly want to introduce you just one possibility to do so. And being an analytical chemist working a lot with mass spectrometry, uh, I'm also quite proud that uh, I contributed uh, to one method using uh, liquid chromatography high resolution mass spectrometry um, with a special software tool that we developed uh, at the EFA tool called Metextruct. Uh, for those of you not so familiar with mass spectrometry, I'll try to talk you through um, what you see uh, in the upper uh, left part of this screen uh, is a typical mass spectrum uh, of one compound. Uh, and let's just assume uh, this is uh, deoxynivalinol uh, and uh, you typically do not see just one peak uh, arising from the monoisotopic mass uh, of deoxynivalinol, but rather a couple of peaks. Um, and these peaks are uh, just one mass unit away from each other. And those are arising uh, from uh, the natural abundance of carbon-13 in nature. Uh, so uh, when you look at the periodic table uh, and look at the molecular mass of uh, carbon, you find out it's 12.011 uh, coming from um, the fact that uh, about 98.9% .9 of the naturally occurring carbon uh, is made from uh, the carbon-12 isotope, from the stable isotope, uh, and about 1.1% are made from carbon-13, which is also a stable, not uh, radioactive isotope. When you have 15 carbon atoms uh, in a molecule, like in the case of deoxynivalinol, there is already a 15% chance uh, that one uh, of the carbon atoms actually is a carbon-13, uh, which uh, yields another peak at the mass uh, of one higher uh, than the monoisotopic mass. When you now have access to fully labeled um, um, deoxynivalinol, in this case, fully labeled by uh, carbon-13, uh, then you have uh, an isotope pattern which is quite uh, vice versa. And this is arising from the fact that, uh, in this case, about 99% uh, of all the isotopes, uh, all the carbon isotopes used for labeling are carbon-13. Uh, and just 1% uh, is carbon-12. So when you mix uh, those two compounds, uh, you get uh, a pattern at one retention time where you have a decreasing uh, intensity uh, and at a certain uh, mass difference, you have an increasing uh, intensity. And this pattern uh, is just there uh, when both the carbon-12 and the carbon-13 compound uh, is present. Uh, and this pattern uh, can be used to really um, find metabolites arising from 
one compound uh, to be metabolized by any species. It's quite tricky uh, with mass spectrometry when you're analyzing, for instance, plant extracts. You've got thousands of peaks. Uh, and to really come up with a meaningful answer to which compound is metabolized in which way, for instance, to mask mycotoxins, uh, this is extremely helpful. And what you see uh, on this slide, uh, it looks a little bit complicated. Uh, in, in fact, it's just a chromatogram. Uh, this is a chromatogram that we gained after treating wheat uh, with a mixture of carbon-12 uh, and carbon-13 labeled deoxynivalenol. What you see is a chromatogram, uh, and uh, in the y-axis uh, uh, pointing up, you see the carbon-12 trace, uh, and the y-axis uh, pointing down, you see the carbon-13 um, intensity. Uh, and they are co uh and all of those peaks you see are really arising from a true metabolite uh, of deoxynivalenol. And uh, using this technique, we found... Um, Again, uh, deoxynivalenol, which was used for the treatment of the plant. We found uh, deoxynivalenol 3 glucosid, which is the major metabolite uh, from deoxynivalenol uh, in crop plants. But we also found D-glucosids, myelodin glucosids, and glutathione uh, conjugates and glutathione processing products uh, of deoxynivalenol. So the next question is, now we are able to detect uh, masked mycotoxins, um, and if we have a standard away level, uh, we can use it uh, to look for its occurrence. Uh, and I want to just give you one example looking for the occurrence of uh, deoxynivalenol 3 glucosid in beer. So for that, we developed an analytical method. Uh, we started that uh, the beer uh, was uh, degassed uh, in an ultrasonic bath to get rid of the carbon dioxide. Uh, we precipitated uh, the proteins uh, using uh, an excess of coal acetonitrile, quickly centrifuge uh, the extract, evaporated it, um, reconstituted it, uh, and measured it using uh, our uh, triple quadruple uh, LCMS MS system. And I would not be an analytical chemist if I would not bother you uh, with some validation data, uh, but uh, the most important thing here is that we did not just take the, uh, uh, the matrix beer, but we really divided uh, the beer by different categories, six categories, uh, dividing the beer in pale beer, wheat beer, dark beer, bock beer, non-alcoholic beers, and shandies, which are mixtures of um, beers with lemonade. Uh, and you can see that the uh, recovery, the apparent recovery, and also the repeatabilities uh, for the different uh, analytes are quite different uh, in the different beer categories. Uh, overall, uh, we got quite acceptable recoveries for the oxynivalenol uh, and its fungal uh, precursor, uh, free acidoxy uh, deoxynivalenol, uh, and still acceptable, uh, although sometimes a little bit low, uh, recoveries for its glucosid. Also, the limits of detection uh, and quantification are quite in the range where we expect um, the compound to occur in nature. And then the really funny part began because uh, we analyzed some 370 beer samples from uh, 38 countries of this world uh, using this method. Uh, and uh, to me it was uh, really quite surprising how many different beers uh, you can find in, in any supermarket uh, just at the corner because if you just go to your next supermarket you can find you easily find about 50 to 100 different beers. Um, and so we collected uh, those uh, about 380 beer samples, analyzed for them. Uh, and what uh, the major outcome was that on average, the highest uh, values of uh, both Don triglucoside and Don were found non-surprisingly in Bock beer. Non-surprisingly because Bock beer has the highest gravity, meaning that the most amount of mold and of cereals in the end was used for the production of bock beer. The highest amount uh, of Don 3 glucosid and Don we found from a beer um, coming from a microbrewery in Austria, where about 80 to 90 micrograms per liter uh, of Don 3 glucosid and Don uh, was found. 
two things here uh, that uh, I wanted to raise the attention. First of all, uh, as you can see from this value, uh, the amount of the masked mycotoxins we uh, see is pretty much the same uh, as the amount and the concentration uh, of the known and the regulated uh, mycotoxin, the oxynivalinol. The second thing is a little bit more tricky to answer, uh, and this is what does these uh, values really mean? So is this high, is this low? And I will come back to that uh, in a couple of slides. So uh, to start with, and this is the, the main part of my presentation, to start with the toxicological significance, uh, I would like uh, to start with uh, the joint FAO uh, WHO expert committee on food additives, CHECFER, uh, that uh, established a group provisional maximum tolerable daily intake value uh, for the oxynivalinol. Uh, and uh, in 2010, uh, they also included uh, their um, uh, fungal precursor 3 adon and 15 adon uh, to that TDI value. The committee also uh, said uh, at that time, at 2010, that uh, don 3-glucosid uh, was not yet included uh, in the TDI, uh, as there is still or was at that time a lack of toxicological data. Uh, late last year, uh, the uh, European Food Safety Authority accepted a mandate from the European Commission to assess, or to assess the risk of masked mycotoxins which is currently ongoing. And um, just keep in mind uh, this uh, TDI uh, that was um, um, suggested by the uh, check for about one microgram per kilogram body weight. If we just use this TDI to come back to our beer study, uh, we can uh, calculate how much um, of the TDI is really exploited uh, by beer consumption. Uh, and to do so, uh, we have done some rough calculations. Most of the beer uh, was Austrian beer, um, and the, typ uh, the typical average Austrian weighs about 74 kilogram. Um, the typical Austrian female uh, weighs about 67 kilogram, while the average male weighs about 81 kilogram. And this is quite a lot compared to the European average of 60 kilogram for female and 70 kilogram for male. Um, also, due to our lifestyle, and one of the reasons could be that Austrians just love to drink beer. Uh, Austria is actually number two in beer consumption worldwide, uh, together with uh, Germany, uh, and uh, way behind the Czech Republic, uh, which is leading uh, this uh, ranking with about 150 liters uh, of beer are drunk by each um, Czech um, um, every year. So for Austria, yeah, and by the way, number four and five in the ranking, if you're, uh, if you're interested, are the UK and Ireland. Um, so about uh, a small glass of beer, about 0.3 liters of beer, uh, are drunk by each Austrian over the age of 16 every year, uh, and every day, sorry. Um, and this means that on an average scenario, taking into account all the beers, um, that about 3 to 4 percent of the TDI are exploited just by peer consumption. Uh, if we take into account also uh, deoxynivalinol 3 glucosid and just for the moment uh, say it has the same toxicity as deoxynivalinol, uh, this value is raised to about 5 to 6 percent. However, if we go to a high scenario, uh, even one glass uh, of this highly contaminated beer, a large glass per day, is enough to completely exploit uh, the uh, DON TDI. So, and now, uh, what do we know about the toxicity uh, of this compound, of the oxynivalinol 3 glucosid? I mentioned briefly before that uh, plants try to defend itself uh, against uh, the fungal invasion, uh, against the toxin, uh, which is used uh, by the fungi to attack the plant by converting it into a less toxic compound like uh, the oxynivalinol 3 glucosid. And when you uh, look at this graph, um, which uh, is a representation of the toxicity on the ribosome level, you see that the oxynivalinol is quite capable, and this is the red curve, to um, inhibit protein uh, translation uh, with increasing uh, concentration of the mycotoxin, whereas 
dioxin nivalumin pretoxid, the mast mycotoxin, barely inhibits it. So from that um, perspective, we could say, at least on the plant level, this is really a detoxification. Where does the problem come from? Uh, the problem comes from that, uh, as I uh, pointed out, uh, not only uh, known fusarium mycotoxins like the oxynivalenol or seralenol are produced uh, and are um, found on the plant as the plants convert uh, these mycotoxins to the glucosids, which will end up uh, in our food and can potentially be hydrolyzed uh, due to uh, the acidic conditions in our stomach, due to enzymatic uh, hydrolysis uh, in uh, our gut, or even to bacterial hydrolysis. And all of this could lead uh, to the cleavage um, of the glucose moiety, releasing uh, or liberating uh, the native toxin again. And uh, to test this, uh, a couple of years ago we did um, some experiments. We treated um, both DON as a positive control, but um, more importantly DON3 glucosid uh, with a variety of acids uh, and uh, enzymes. And when you look uh, at the 0.2 molar hydrochloric acid, which is a concentration that is far higher uh, than it's uh, actually occurring in the stomach of humans, this is a pH value of 0.7, uh, you see that this compound is completely resistant uh, to the acid. So even after 18 hours, uh, nothing is cleaved. Um, then we tested a variety of enzymes, including the human enzyme, the human beta-glucosidase, uh, which we got as a recombinant enzyme. And again, um, the beta-glucosid, down 3 uh, glucosid is not cleaved uh, by this enzyme. So this is good news. However, uh, we also tested a variety of bacterial strains that were isolated from human guts. Uh, and whereas some um, prominent uh, bacteria like uh, E. coli are not able to cleave uh, DOM3 glucosid, some other bifidobacteria, Enterococcus or Lactobacilli, are, qu are quite capable uh, in doing so. So the next step is, okay, this is very nice, this is in vitro data, but uh, what does this mean in vivo? Uh, and so uh, the first experiment that we performed uh, was testing the in vivo toxicity of this compound, the oxynivalenol 3 glucosid, uh, in rats. We used a repeated measures design, uh, meaning that uh, at the first day of the treatment, uh, the animals received just water as a negative control uh, by gavage. Um, a week later, uh, we applied uh, the oxynivalenol uh, at the concentration of 2 milligrams per kilogram body weight. And a week later, uh, we applied the equimolar amount of DOM3 glucosid. And finally, we collected uh, the urine and feces uh, of the animals which were excreted after 24 and 48 hours. We used uh, a validated uh, LC-MS-MS-based biomarker method not only looking uh, for the oxynivalenol and its triglucosid, but also for uh, the known uh, metabolization product, the mammalian metabolization products, the epoxy, uh, the oxynivalenol, and the glucuronate um, of uh, the oxynivalenol. So what um, the animals do is after taking up uh, the oxynivalenol, um, it is uh, in, the, um, in the gut, uh, converted, especially uh, in rats, to its less toxic, uh, the epoxy, DON, which is then excreted in feces, or, and, or, uh, it can be uh, metabolized in the liver to its glucuronate, uh, which is then uh, later excreted in urine. So this is just uh, the sample cleanup uh, and uh, some details about the measurement. Let's come straight to the results. So when we look just at urine for the time being, uh, and when we look uh, at the negative control at the water uh, group, we found, surprisingly, uh, some deoxynivalenol and deoxynivalenol glucuronate already in this group. And this was due to the fact that this was quite impossible to find red feed, which was not contaminated uh, with deoxynivalenol. So we tested several uh, feed stuffs uh, and we uh, decided to take this one with the lowest contamination of the oxynivalenol, which is in the range of 160 ppb, 
um, which is not of major significance uh, to the amount of toxins that we uh, treated the animal with, but still uh, it is detectable. When we look at the DON group, uh, at the positive control group, we found some individual uh, differences between uh, the rats. Uh, more importantly, we found that the major metabolite excreted in urine uh, was, not uh, surprisingly, uh, the DON group urinate. We also found uh, minor amounts of the D-epoxy metabolite. And when we look uh, at DON3 glucoside, uh, we see, first of all, that uh, just minor amounts compared uh, to the DON positive control uh, are excreted uh, intact uh, in urine, meaning that DON3 glucoside is little bioavailable uh, compared to deoxymivarinol. We found larger concentration of both DON uh, and its glucuronate, uh, and this is really the first proof uh, that uh, deoxynivalinol uh, 3 is cleaved, is liberated uh, in the form of DON. It is absorbed in the bloodstream, metabolized further uh, to its glucuronate, uh, and then excreted uh, in urine. So this is the first indication, the first real proof uh, that DON3 glucoside is, um, in fact, a mask mycotoxin. When we look uh, at feces, uh, again, uh, in the water group, we found uh, some uh, amounts of deoxynivalinol coming from the diet. We did not found uh, the glucuronate. We found uh, in the DON group uh, the, the epoxy metabolite as the major metabolite uh, in feces. And uh, when we look uh, at the DON3 glucoside group in feces, we barely find any remaining DON3 glucoside meaning that uh, basically all of this compound is cleaved. However, we find quite large amounts of deoxynivalinol and also of the epoxy um, DON in feces. Uh, and this study was published uh, two years ago. In the meantime, uh, we went on uh, and we were asking uh, ourselves the question, could this be species dependent? Uh, and uh, is it not likely that uh, rats are maybe not the perfect system to, um, to look for differences in uh, metabolism of DON3 glucoside? And what is the significance of this rat study to the human? So we decided to take uh, another species which is very closely related to the human. Uh, and you can see here uh, the species which I just taken a very famous graph from Leonardo da Vinci and slightly modified it. Uh, I guess you can look for the for the error. But anyway, we used the study uh, with piglets, um, and uh, we hosted uh, those piglets in metabolic cages, uh, and again collected urine and feces uh, and analyzed uh, how much of the DOM glucoside is actually cleaved. Uh, the study design uh, was pretty similar as the red design, so we applied uh, water uh, at the first um, um, time point. A couple of days later we applied uh, DON3 glucoside. Again a couple of days later we applied DON as the positive control in the equimolar amount. Um, also I would like to show you that the concentrations that we used here are far lower. So we had about 75 microgram per kilogram uh, body weight uh, in pigs, uh, which was a level uh, which is below uh, the no observed adverse effect limit in pigs, so the pigs uh, were not uh, experiencing any symptoms coming from the toxin. And we also decided to intravenously uh, administer uh, DON3 glucoside uh, to assess its bioavailability. Again, um, after um, in two time um, uh, periods, so from 0 to 8 hours and from 8 to 24 hours, we sampled uh, urine feces and used our validated method uh, to uh, analyze DOM3 glucoside, uh, the deoxynivalinol and its major metabolites. And coming to the results, this is the DON group. So in urine, which is the left bar and which is the only you can see because we did not found any metabolites in feces, we recovered about 85% uh, of uh, all uh, administered deoxynivalinol, which is pretty um, consistent with literature uh, and which explains that deoxynivalinol is very, very bioavailable. 
Uh, most of the compounds that we uh, recovered were either DOM uh, or uh, it's, uh, in this case, uh, it's 15 uh, glucuronate. So whereas rats are rather converting the compound to a 3 glucuronate, um, humans, as we know now, uh, and also pigs, are converting it to a 3 and 15, uh, majority to the 15 glucuronate. When we look at the DOM glucosid group, uh, we see a similar picture we find just uh, a little bit uh, in thesis, the overall recovery uh, is lower, but about half uh, of the um, concentrations that we found uh, in urine, uh, we uh, found also, uh, so, sorry, that we also found for deoxynivalinol, uh, we can find uh, a thon 3 glucosid in the form, uh, again, majorly of uh, its glucuronate uh, and DOM, uh, but also some uh, some other uh, compounds. Uh, and this is really, uh, this should provide us with a very rough uh, estimation uh, and uh, at least in piglets we can um, summarize that the toxicity of DOM3 glucosid arising from the fact that it is cleaved uh, towards DOM, taken up and excreted is about half of that uh, of deoxynivalenol. And we think that in human it might be um, quite similar. Finally, uh, this is just uh, to finalize the story. When we look uh, at the DOM 3 glucosid, which was uh, applied intravenously, um, the compound seems to be extremely stable. Uh, so uh, we uh, uh, recovered about 100% of the compound, mainly in the form of its glucosid. So with all of this, I would like to come to the conclusions. And uh, I hope to provide you with some insight uh, over the last 30 minutes that uh, mycotoxins can be, and in fact they are, metabolized to plants, um, forming conjugated or masked forms, which is uh, still or currently especially a, um, a topic which is hotly debated in all of mycotoxin research, that we are able uh, and uh, to detect uh, new mask mycotoxins and they are constantly detected, um, mostly glucosidic form but also amino acid conjugates are uh, recently uh, discovered. The con uh, concentration of certain uh, conjugated toxins can even exceed uh, the concentration in native forms uh, in, um, in typical cases like adhesive effect for uh, beer uh, and deoxynivalinol 3 glucosid. Uh, regarding DON3 glucosid, uh, it is hydrolyzed uh, during the gestion in vitro as it's cleaved by several intestinal bacteria. Uh, and also in vivo, uh, it is almost completely hydrolyzed. Uh, the hydrolysis after absorption um, uh, is of little relevance. Um, and uh, this, we also concluded uh, that uh, the oxynivalinol 3 glucosid is rather low. Um, the bioavailability of this compound is rather low compared to the exonivalinol, uh, but there are species-dependent differences, uh, and concluding from our yet unpublished study, uh, which is currently uh, under review for piglets, uh, we uh, conclude that the toxicity, uh, that the apparent toxicity of the oxynivalinol 3 glucosid is about half of that of the native toxin. And uh, with that, I want to thank uh, all the sponsors of the study, of course you for your attention. And before I am very happy to answer uh, any questions uh, if you have them, I would like uh, to point out uh, that uh, I'm very happy uh, to host another uh, Roma Labs webinar uh, in early June. So if you are interested in the development, validation and also the application, of LCMS MS based method for the determination of mycotoxins in food and feed, uh, you are um, invited uh, to join that webinar as well. Thank you very much, and uh, I will be uh, still online for uh, a couple of minutes to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, uh, so I got one question about um, is it possible, my French is not really good, but I think uh, is it possible that you can get this presentation? 
Uh, and uh, yes, uh, there will be a follow-up uh, of this webinar. Uh, and uh, also, if you have uh, further questions, uh, which we are not able to answer, which I'm not able to answer in the next minutes, feel free uh, to send them in. Uh, all of those questions will be answered. Uh, and all of you interested can receive a copy, a PDF copy uh, of this uh, presentation. Okay, we have another question uh, that is, what was the spike level for DON3 glucosid, uh, the recovery data? So I have to look up. I think this uh, is relating to, might be relating to the beer uh, story. Uh, and we used um, four different uh, spiking levels. So what you see is the, um, or what you have seen is the apparent recovery uh, over the whole uh, range from the lower to the upper limit of quantification. Uh, and the study has been published, both the survey uh, and uh, the analytical method. So if you're interested in this, just look for the World Mycotoxin Journal and my name and also uh, all the uh, citations uh, are provided in the, in the slides so you can easily look up for the publication. Um, another question is, have you done any inoculation of DON on plants to see response over time? Yes, we did. Uh, and um, so um, this is also covered in uh, one publication by Bernhard Kluger. Uh, so what we did is that, or quickly summarizing the, the results of that, is that uh, the oxynivalenol uh, is decreasing uh, the concentration. So we have done this inoculation both with the pure toxin uh, and also with Fusarium graminearum, uh, which is producing uh, the toxin. Um, the concentration of DOM3 glucosid uh, is going up. Uh, and then uh, also the concentration of some further metabolites like its malonyl glucosid are going up over time. Here it's quite tricky to really um, talk about the concentration as for most of these compounds, we still don't have the standards. We have standards for uh, DON and DON3-glucosid, of course, and about 20% uh, of the DON was converted to DON3-glucosid uh, in that study. Okay, another question is, how can we do the screening of these mask mycotoxins in raw materials like cereals? Um, there are a couple of possibilities. Uh, one possibility would be if standard uh, is available, uh, and this is at the moment just uh, commercially available from Roma Labs for Don 3 glucosid, uh, you can use uh, any chromatographic technique um, to where you separate Don and Don 3 glucosid. Uh, if you have uh, the possibility to use mass spectrometry, uh, this is what I recommend. Um, in principle, also ELISAs would work uh, as the you get uh, some value uh, for uh, the oxynivalenol, which has given a cross-reactivity of 100%. It's the target analyt. Uh, but uh, the cross-reactivity of different ELISAs towards different forms of mycotoxin can be quite different. So it might be hard uh, if um, to really come up uh, with a value. There also have been a couple of uh, methods uh, suggesting acidic hydrolysis uh, to come up with a sum value uh, for the oxynivalenol at least. However, I cannot recommend this value uh, as uh, they really do not work uh, quite well. Good, then the next question is, can you tell us where does the struggle belongs <laughs> to which group of products and what are the limits for ochratoxin in struggle? Thank you so much. Okay, um, I do not understand this question, honestly, so I try to answer it later. Uh, limits for ochratoxin A uh, are uh, given by the, for instance, by the uh, European legislation, uh, so I can also send you uh, the legislation for that. Okay, the next question is, is this pattern of lower bioavailability and toxicity of DOM3 glucosid applicable to other mask mycotoxins? 
Uh, the simple answer is no, it is not. Uh, and this is also uh, the difficult answer because um, honestly what we have to do and what toxicologists have to do is first uh, I think uh, the question is which compounds uh, are occurring in nature. Then the next question is uh, at which concentrations are they occurring uh, and those uh, compounds which could be a problem should be tested. The uh, we are currently conducting a study using serolinol uh, glucosid with pigs uh, and also some other metabolites of serolinone. However, it is known from serolinone that uh, the glucosids are pretty much cleaved, uh, at least in, in studies done in the 1990s. Uh, so uh, the serolinone uh, compounds seem to be um, rather more cleaved and rather bio more bioavailable uh, than the oxynivalinol uh, 3 glucosid. Another question, are long-term feeding studies in mice at superacute doses of mycotoxins common? Can you give us an example? Huh. This is, no, I can't give you an example. Um, I think there, um, probably CHECFA is the best source to, uh, to look up at the, at the studies because they're pretty uh, well summarizing uh, all the toxicity studies that have been done. Uh, however, I think that um, to, in order to see an effect coming from deoxynivalinol, the concentration has to be rather high. So uh, I'm not aware of, uh, this doesn't mean that they do not exist, uh, but I'm not aware of, of long-term studies. Uh, and uh, I, I can't give you an example for that, I'm sorry. Next question is, um, is Dawn still the best indicator of grain quality? Um, well, this is tricky to answer. Uh, I would say depending on the country uh, where this grain is analyzed, it is still a, a very good indicator. Uh, what we have to keep in mind that um, some varieties of grains that are now on the market and also on the field possess a far higher uh, ability of, for instance, um, the oxynivalinol to be converted to its 3-glucosid. The reason for that is uh, that Adon 3-glucosid uh, is not toxic to the plant. So we could end up with a scenario where the Don level is going down and the Don 3-glucosid level is going up. Uh, and we should keep in mind at least the sum parameter uh, or um, let's say uh, if, we, if we count uh, with the toxicity of um, that from Don 3 glucosid, uh, it's about half the toxicity as Don. Still, uh, Don 3 glucosid should be monitored. Uh, however, I, I fully agree with you that um, Don is, is a good indicator of grain quality. Um, another question is what about other mycotoxins as aflatoxin B1 and ochratoxin A? Um, the most we know about masked forms are from fusarium mycotoxins. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, typically with fusarium uh, mycotoxins, the infection takes place on the field. Uh, so uh, the plant is growing, uh, metabolically very, very active, and so most of these masked forms are actually made by the plant. Um, for aflatoxins, where there can be some, uh, of course, uh, infection already on the field, However, um, um, they are rather often regarded also as storage uh, uh, fungi um, and also for ochratoxin A. So uh, they, the levels of them are rising. Again, this is not, uh, it should not be too simplified too much, but rather it's, it's storage conditions where the plants are, if not dead, then metabolically very, very um, slow and uh, inactive. So I think that's the reason why most of it is known for for monocins, um, for uh, zeralinone, and for deoxynivalinol. There has been some uh, plant metabolites of ochratoxin R described in literature, also glucosids. I'm not aware of any um, plant metabolites of aflatoxins that have been described. Another question, uh, you believe plants can be breed to be resistant to Don infections? Yes, I, I strongly believe in this. 
uh, and um, I have seen uh, this and I am involved in several studies uh, proving this. Um, there, uh, what plant breeders do uh, is to cross varieties uh, which are resistant uh, toward fungal infections with um, high yield varieties uh, and uh, several uh, qualitative trait loci have been identified. One of the most famous one is SUMA3, uh, which is uh, really um, increasing the capability of the plants to uh, form don pre glucosid So this is what is being done at the moment and this uh, um, varieties of, of wheat are already on the field. Um, another question, what is your limit of detection on LC-MS-MS for DON and DON3 glucosid? Uh, this really depends. Uh, we have um, at least four different uh, LC-MS-MS systems. Uh, I can answer you the question quite easily for um, the 5500 Q-trap uh, and the beer matrix. So the limit of quantification is, let me look, it was about 3 uh, ppb, 3 microgram per liter um, in beer uh, for the oxynivalinol uh, and about 1.3 uh, microgram per liter uh, for the oxynivalinol 3 glucosid. Um, this is uh, keeping in mind that we don't use uh, any purification or, or any uh, specific uh, purification. Uh, we just um, diluted the beer and in injected the beer after uh, uh, precipitation of proteins. So uh, if you use specific columns like microsap columns, SPE columns, uh, you might be able to purify uh, the matrix uh, and increase the limits of detection. However, uh, one microgram uh, per liter is already quite good, so there might not be the need for that. But uh, depending on the LC-MS-MS instrument you're using, there might be a need. Another question, what about petulin? Is there a similar effect? I'm not aware uh, of um, a similar effect for petulin. So petulin usually occur in apples, apple products. Um, can be been metabolized by apples. I think nobody has, has looked at this so far. So I, I really cannot answer this. Another question, do you get lower LOD on a Q-trap versus a Q-tof instrument? In principle, yes. Uh, so we use the Q-trap instrument from, from AB Sykes, uh, which is in principle a triple quadruple instrument. Uh, the uh, final quadruple can be used uh, as uh, an ion trap. But uh, the triple quadruples, all of them are more sensitive uh, in SRM mode uh, than QDOF instrument. Having said this, um, the QTOF instruments and TOF instruments in general have uh, become more and more popular uh, and uh, also the sensitivity of this instrument uh, is, is greatly improving. But still I would say we are about a factor of 10 uh, away from, uh, from triple quads approximately. Okay, so I guess that's it for the for the questions that have come in so far. If you have further questions, uh, please feel free uh, to contact Roma uh, or myself. Uh, I'm, I'm happy uh, to answer that in the upcoming days. There will be uh, a follow-up uh, of this presentation uh, and uh, you can also receive the, the slides of this presentation. So thank you very much and depending uh, on the country you're living in, have a nice evening uh, uh, or a nice morning or um, see, you, see you at the next uh, presentation which is taking place on June the 10th uh, again at the same time. Thank you very much.